Ephesians 5, 15 to 21. If you could all stand for the word of God and receive his word. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That is the word of God. Amen. Good morning, and good morning to you, those of you who are at home or wherever you are, virtually worshiping with us as well. <clears throat> just want to reiterate just a couple of announcements. Um, this coming Saturday is, well, Halloween on our calendars, but uh, as church, we normally celebrate Fall Family Festival, but because of the pandemic, we are going to have, be having a family movie night. So uh, you do need to sign up, register online. And if you don't know how to do that, please reach out to, uh, to any of the pastors and we'll be able to help guide you to register before you come. There's also a uh, costume contest, actually. So uh, if you and your family decide to wear costumes, it must not be horrific or anything scary, um, but um, dress up, uh, take a picture of it, and then you'll be sending it in. All that information is actually online, so uh, if you need more information, just let us know. And of course, the London Town Elementary School uh, giving, Pastor David did a wonderful job in uh, making that uh, announcement, but I also want to really urge you to join us uh, for that Saturday. It's only for 30 minutes, but it's a time where we can really help out in, in serving the community. Uh, it is a, uh, what is it? Oh. Not phase one school, what is it? Anyways, it's, a, it's that kind of school, <laughs> so uh, we need your help, uh, especially if you speak Spanish, uh, that would be a plus, but you don't have to, but that's a, a place where you can really uh, share the love of Christ uh, to those uh, in our community. All right, it's been a while since I've been here. I feel, I'm not sure exactly how to start this, so let's just pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much, God, for giving us this time together, uh, Lord, uh, Father, may it not just be our lips, Lord, may it not just be our bodies, but our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Father, help us to be able to worship you today. May you receive the worship today, and that you would be glorified. Father, we want to thank you for what you will do through this message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, when, I was, um, when I was a young boy, uh, Growing up in the church, one of the things that I uh, noticed was that every time uh, the church, every time the body got together, we would uh, always start the, ba- the gathering with worship, always. It didn't matter what it was for, uh, and it didn't matter where we were. Uh, obviously, on Sundays, uh, we would gather together at the church building to worship today. But even when we got together at someone else's, someone's home, we would always start the gathering with worship, with worship. As a young boy, I understood that we got together to worship at church on Sunday. But there were many times when I thought it was awkward. There were many times when I thought maybe it was even inappropriate to worship. For instance, when we get together as a body, as a church at someone's house, the dinner would be uh, in preparation. People are still working in the kitchen. But when the pastor walks through the door, he would call everyone to come together to have a short time of worship. Now, maybe it was short for the adults, 
But as a kid, I remember it would always start by getting out your hymnals, chansonga. And we would sing with no instruments, just voices. We would sing a couple hymns, two hymns, with countless repeats of the chorus of the hymn. And after we sang the hymns, the elder or the deacon would pray, not for one minute, but a prayer that seemed endless and very long. And then the pastor would give a full, all-out three-point sermon that I did not understand because it was all in Korean. After the sermon, we would sing another hymn as a response to the message. And afterward, we would pray together. And then the pastor would give a benediction. And then he would pray for the meal, which was never a short prayer. All the while, the noodles are still boiling in the water. All the while, the food was getting cold. Anyone? Experience? Yet everyone there, at least from what I saw, everybody was together in worship, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, this thing that I just explained to you happened not only in someone's home, at the airport, a busy airport, sending someone off, this would happen. At a busy restaurant, where the waiters would come in with the food and have no idea what to do because we're all bowing down and praying. At a park full of screaming children and the boomboxes playing loud music, it did not matter where we were. It did not matter what we were doing, uh, what we were there, for what occasion. But the message which was clear, when everybody got together, we submitted to one another out of reverence for Christ. So at a young age, I understood that what brought us together, which is the title of today's sermon, what brought us together, what set us apart from the world was worship out of reverence for Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us in our passage today, that we must make the best use of the time. The best use of the time because the days are evil, verse 16. And we can relate with that today. And we must understand the will of the Lord, verse 17. And that will of the Lord is what? It says it right after that. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our hearts, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verses 19 to 21, or 15 to 21. In other words, what brings the body of Christ together is what? Worship. Amen? What is worship? Now, we can answer that in so many ways. And there are libraries of books out there to try to answer that very question. What is worship? But I found Google Dictionary says it plain and simple. Worship as a noun is the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for God. Quote, worship as a verb is showing reverence and adoration for God. Straight from the Googles. Google, search that up and find it for yourself. Reverence. And so as the body of Christ, we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, verse 21. You have to think with me today. Don't just listen. And so worship is what brings the body of believers together in Christ. And that's what sets us apart from the world. It sets us apart 
and brings, worship brings us together in Christ. Do you see it? I hope you see it. Okay, so I'm going to go somewhere with this. So stay with me. Now these days during the pandemic, I can see, truly see, the enemy, Satan, is trying to pull us apart and scatter the body. That's what the enemy is doing right now, trying to scatter the body. Now that could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. Right? In the book of Acts, if you read the Bible, when the early believers were scattered, scattered, there was a what? Diaspora. Right? There was a, a dispersion because of, due to the persecution of the Christian, of Christians. And that actually didn't kill the body. It caused the body to grow, which is why we are even here today, because of that. Now today, due to the pandemic, I don't know if that is what God is trying to do. I, I don't know. Maybe that is the revival that God has in mind through and after this pandemic. Because we know that God does his best work in the worst times. Amen? All right? And so at the moment, as we feel so scattered physically, we feel scattered physically, I am all the more convinced that worship, whether it be online virtual or on-site in person, is the one thing that brings the body together in Christ. It is not the events that bring us together. It is not the programs. It's not the system or anything else. It is worship, the reverence for Christ that brings the body to submit to one another, giving songs of praise, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? No, I haven't even gotten to the good stuff. I think that's good. So hold on. And so... During the months of this pandemic, I was so blessed. Yeah, there's a lot of bad going on, but I was so blessed to see that so many in our church have decided to get married or have come together in marriage, to have a wedding even at this time. Because that is not only a sign of hope, marriage, a time of joy and celebration in the midst of this situation, but it is a sign that we will have a future, right? It is a sign that this body will continue to not only survive through this pandemic, but thrive and overcome this pandemic with joy and love. Can you say amen? Now, why am I talking about marriage and weddings all of a sudden. We started talking about worship of the body of believers. But why is Pastor Daniel and me taking about, talking about marriage of the groom and the bride? I'm going to give you a hint. Body, bride. If you got it, good. If you didn't, Try to catch up. Listen, you shouldn't ask me why I'm talking about worship of the body and then all of a sudden about the marriage of the groom and bride. You should ask Paul the Apostle because that's what he's doing here in Ephesians chapter 5. He talked about worship and now... Right after our passage that we read, he's talking about a wedding, marriage, in verse 22 and on, which we didn't read together, but I want you to listen to this, or if you have your Bibles, you can open it up as well. Right after Paul says in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, he says, wives 
Submit to your own husbands. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he and is himself the savior of that body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. I'm just reading from the Bible. Husbands, love your wives as how? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such things, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are what? Members of his body. Therefore, he says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast, in some translations, cleave. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Right? Therefore, I hope you're listening, a man shall leave who? His parent, leave his parent and cleave to his wife, his bride, and the two shall become one flesh. Remember that. What I just said, what the Bible says. Paul here, therefore, that verse, is quoting Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. That's what he's doing. It's not his words. It's the first wedding that he is quoting. And then after Paul quotes Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, there he says, this is a mystery. This mystery is profound. What is this that he's talking about? It is this, he's talking, this mystery, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, marriage, wedding. And then Paul says, but I am saying that it, this marriage, refers to Christ and the church. What is it again? Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, marriage. It refers to Christ and the church. Oh, I hope you're following. And he's talking about what? The relationship between Christ and the church. He's talking about Christ, the head, and his body, the church. He's talking about Christ, the groom, and his bride, the church. And then in the last verse, verse 33, he concludes all of this by saying, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects, respects, honors, see that she reveres, reverence, reveres her husband, reverence. There's that word again. Now, some of our modern people, postmodern folks who are here, will be hearing this and cringing from this ver these verses. But let me tell you, do not use your marriage as the standard to understand this text, okay? Even my marriage is way far off. It falls way short to what the Bible speaks on marriage, right? But what I want us to look at here is this. Paul talks about worship of the body. And he uses the metaphor or marriage of the bride, and he brings it all together and says, therefore, a man shall leave his parent and hold fast to, cleave to his wife, his bride, and the two shall become what? One flesh. But this is a mystery. And let me remind you, I am really talking about, Paul says, Christ and his relationship 
with the church, Christ and the church. And he ends it again with a reference back to reverence of the bride to her husband. In other words, what brings Christ and his bride, his body, together is worship. Now, in order to fully grasp this mystery that is being revealed to us, it hasn't been created by Paul. He says it's a mystery. He is revealing it to us. God is revealing it to us through Paul's writing. And so if we want to understand this revelation, we have to go back to what he was quoting. What did he quote? Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, or really the beginning. And so here we go. That was the introduction. You ready? Okay. I can't see your faces. We know that in the beginning, after God created everything in six days, he created Adam, the first man. The first man. And as Adam went around naming the animals, because that was his job, that's what he was called to do, and he was doing his duty, working the Garden of Eden, he notices as he does this, the birds have a mate. Right? A male and a female bird coming together. He notices monkeys have their own mates. The animals had their, all their pairs. But for him, the Bible says, he found no one suitable. Right? A dog is a man's best friend. That's it, right? He had no helper fit for him, as the Bible tells us. And that was the first time when God said, it is not good. That's the first time. He said it was good in the first day. It is good the second day. It is good and good and good. But this is the first time when God says, recorded in the Bible, something is not good. And what is that? He said, it is not good for man to be alone. So I will make a helper, fit, fit for him, fit for him. And so what does God do here? He causes a deep sleep, the Bible tells us, to fall upon Adam. He causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And then while Adam was asleep, he goes in and he takes one of his ribs, right, ribs out of his side. He takes a rib out of his side and out of the man, I hope you're listening. Out of the man he made, he produced a woman out of him, out of him, and he brought her back to him, back to the man. And Adam says, she is bone of my bones. She is flesh of my flesh because she was taken out of man, okay, taken out of man. And then she was brought back to him. And then Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, therefore, right after that, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. A man shall leave his parent and hold fast, cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so what does that mean? This woman, she came from him. She came out of him and now is brought back to him. You're making the connections, aren't you? Back to him, and he says, she is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In other words, what does that mean? She is my body. At the same time, she is my bride. My body and my bride. And now they are one flesh. Adam cannot get with the birds. Adam cannot unite with his dog. But Adam can come together perfectly with Eve because she is my body. She is my bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She is my bride returned. That's a key word. Returned back to him as one flesh. Therefore, man shall leave his parent and cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. And so, that was the first Adam. The first Adam. That's the profound mystery being revealed, not through the first Adam, but as Paul says, I am referring to Christ and the church, the last Adam. 
The mystery being revealed is the last Adam. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we didn't read, but you can read for yourself. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about this last Adam. We know that the last Adam, who is Paul talking about? Paul is talking about Jesus the Christ, right? The first Adam, the first man is Adam. The last Adam is Jesus Christ. And he is basically saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that you are either of the first Adam or you are of the last Adam. The first Adam is natural, carnal. The last Adam is spiritual. The first Adam is from the earth. The last Adam is from the heavens. The first Adam is the created son of God. The last Adam is the begotten son of God. And in God's eyes, you are either in the first Adam or in the last Adam. We are all born in the first Adam. Adam, but we must leave to be born again, to cleave to be in the last Adam. Amen? The last Adam had to leave his parent, his father. He had to leave, and just like the first Adam was put to sleep to gain his bride, the last Adam was put to sleep to gain his bride. The last Adam was put to sleep to gain his bride. They crucified him on the cross so that he could be with his bride. A bride that was chosen in him, that was brought out of him so that we might return to him. Do you see it? Do you see it? And when Jesus, the last Adam, was on the cross, he fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies by being obedient unto death as a sacrificial lamb for our sins. And since he died on that cross, before they could even break his legs as they did to the ones under the left and right, Jesus fulfilled the messianic prophecy that not one of his bones would be broken. Psalm 34, verse 20. John chapter 19, verse 36. And there, the Roman soldiers, they didn't break his legs, and so they wanted to check if he was dead. What do they do? They pierced his side. They pierced his side. Wait a minute, side. Side. They pierced his side, and out of his side came out blood and water. It gushed out blood and water, poured out blood and water. What does that mean? In other words, the redemption by his blood, the redemption of our sins by his blood, and not only blood, water, the life by the springs of living water coming out of his side. And that produced out of his side the church, his bride. The church that was chosen in him was brought out from him so that we might return to him. And just as Paul said, a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that this mystery is referring to Christ and his bride, is referring to Christ and his body the church. Paul is saying the best metaphor to describe the relationship of Christ and the church is marriage. And so let the wife see that she respects her husband is how he ends it. Let the wife see that she reveres her husband. Let the wife see that she honors her husband. What does that mean? Let the bride of Christ let the church worship Christ, our bridegroom and our head. What brings us together, brothers and sisters? Worship brings us together as the body. Worship brings us together as the bride with Christ as one flesh. In the midst of this pandemic, the enemy, Satan, the devil, I don't know what you care what you call him, can take away all of our earthly and worldly things. Take it all away. But the enemy can never, ever take away our worship. Amen? Can never take away our worship. Our joy for worship. 
our happiness in worship. Brothers and sisters, let us not be apart, but be set apart from the world as we sing psalms and hymns, making melody to the Lord with our heart, giving thanks even in the midst of this pandemic. Thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ because the days are evil. That's it. <laughs> Listen. Wives, you know this to be true because it is in my life as well. Just as when you praise your husband, 아이고, 잘했어, 잘했어. When you, when you lift your husband up, oh, you're doing so well, you know, I'm proud of you, support. When we respect our husband, they get closer to you. <laughs> when we respect, they, they get uplifted, right? Let us, as the bride, as the body of Christ, worship Jesus, and he be lifted up, and he will come closer to you. He will come close to you as one flesh. Please come up and lead praise. Today, that is what we feel. And that's what we need. The restoration of worship. The unification. The reuniting of the bride and the groom. Let's pray together. If you need to, join me in prayer as I pray for us and before our response song. Pray with me. Lord, yes, God, in the midst of this pandemic, as we've been separate physically, not being able to come to church for so long, worshiping virtually, Lord, we see how our church has been scattered. But God, the enemy can never take away the worship that we have for you. Lord, we are your bride, and we lift you up today. Whether we are at home or here on site, Father, we come together as one body in Christ to worship you and praise you. Lord, I pray, Father, that you receive our worship, that you be glorified today, that we come together not as two but as one flesh together before you. And so, God, I pray that you would come and restore our worship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.